if you go online on the subject of giving and tithing and offering, there is a lot and a lot of questions. A lot of people they no longer believe that you know, this is still a practice of today, I mean, especially tithing, because it, it only was based on the Levitical priesthood. But if you read the argument online, they, there's a lot of things that goes around uh, that, it, that, they, that they say about this subject. And uh, for me, okay, half an hour will not, okay, I will not be able to explain it to you uh, with the given time frame. So I thought that I will, I will just draw some principles, okay, some biblical principles okay, on the subject of uh, um, tithing and giving that I hope that will throw a little light, okay, help us understand the subject a little bit. Just a few principles. And the first principle is the principle of honoring God. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10. Okay. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10. You see, the Bible tells us okay, to honor the uh, children, honor your parents. Okay. This is the first of the commandments that come with a promise. Okay. If you want to live a long, I'm just paraphrasing, if you want to live a, a long life on earth, okay, the Bible says you, you honor your father and your mother, with it comes uh, the reward of a long life. We are told to honor God with our bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, it says, Therefore, honor God with your body, for your body is no longer your own. Okay, you are bought with a price. Okay, we're told to, to honor God with your body. If you read the story of uh, Eli, Eli and his uh, sons, it's in the book of Samuel, okay, 1 Samuel, I think, chapter 2, where God rejected Eli as priest. Because, and his sons, because of the things that they were doing. They were accepting uh, bribery, and his sons were into sexual immorality with the, the women that worked around the, the tents. So God said, I will honor those who honor me, and I will despise those who reject me. So the word honor, basically, um, it's either to ascribe unto something or someone what he is due, as in this case, God. Okay. We, God is worthy okay, of, all the, of all the honor for who he is. As the uh, King David said, You also, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the majesty and the splendor and the honor and the glory. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. So God is worthy of the honor. And the other um, way in which honor is used is... Eh? something that is achieved. We honor people for what they have achieved in life. And God is, is worthy of that honor as well for what he has done. Not only for who he is, but for, who, for what he has done for us. Okay, so on the principle of honor, in regards to giving, it says in ch chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, okay? with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. It doesn't tell you how much to give. It doesn't tell you the amount to give. But the, the, the writer of this, of this book says, okay, but honor the Lord okay, with, the, with your wealth. Okay, we're talking about giving and tithing here, okay, where your heart is. Where your treasure is, your heart will be there as well. We must honor God. Okay? It does not tell you how much or the amount to give in this verse. But 10% was uh, the requirement by God to the Israelites regarding the, 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 uh, the, the tribes of Levi or the Levites. Because if you understand, the, if you read the story, 
The Levites alone, the tribe of Levi alone, did not have any allotment of land. When the land of Canaan was divided or subdivided amongst the 12 tribes, this one tribe did not inherit any land. Because the Lord says, God is his portion, or the, the, because the God is their portion. So no land was given to the Levites. And therefore, but they were allocated little towns where they would, uh, they, because they had families as well. So these little towns amongst the uh, tribes, 12 tribes, okay, they had, uh, they were called the towns of the Levites. You can find that in the, in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua as well. So 10% was, was specifically commanded by God for every Israelite to give as a food, okay, a sustenance for the for the priest, for them to do their duty. That is why if you read the book of Malachi, there was a curse. God said, you have robbed me in tithe and offering. But the context is, you have to read the context from the book of Nehemiah. Because it says that the priest had left their, their role, their duty, and has gone back to their own towns to, do, to work, to feed their families. Because the people had neglected their, their role to provide meat for the, in the house of the Lord, the priest had left his role and duty as a priest to go and work for, okay, to put food on the table and for his family. That's why God says, sir, there's a curse on the, on the people. Okay, but the Bible says that we are to, to honor the Lord with your wealth. Okay? You honor God with your bodies, in whatever that you do, okay? Don't forget to honor God with, with what he has blessed you as well. Okay? In those days, that's why it says here, with the first fruit of your, with your crops. Okay? We, we know not all of us are farmers, okay? but there are a lot of farmers here. Okay? Okay, but whatever that God has blessed you with, do not forget okay, to honor God with, with your wealth. The second principle, the principle of love, the heart of giving. I've, sh I've preached on this already from the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay, honor God with, with your wealth. For me, I give a tithe whether people agree with it or they don't agree, give, agree with it, as soon as I get my, my paycheck, uh, or it's wired through our bank accounts, okay? it comes through every Wednesday night. Thursday morning before I go to work, I make sure I, I send my, my tithe. I mean, it's not mine at the end of the day. Okay? But it has been a practice in our family for a long, very long time. Okay? And, uh, I tend to honor God in that way. It doesn't mean that I don't give offerings as well. But tithe, I specifically put it aside. Okay, that, that's between me and God. Yeah, I don't know what you hold on to, okay? but if you know, okay, if you know what it is, okay, that everything comes from God. At the end of the day, okay, I honor God with, with the first fruits. Okay? Before I spend my, anything, my money on it through the week, before I buy anything, before I send money to my, uh, to, uh, to my wife, uh, not every time, but sometimes, okay? or before I buy anything, okay, I make sure that uh, the tithe goes before anything else. That is just the way that I have done things all, all my life. Okay, the principle of, of love. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8, verse 7 and 8, it says, But since you excel in everything, okay, since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see also that you excel in this grace of giving. 
Okay, verse 8, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So giving is the test of the sincerity of, of your love. Okay. How genuine is uh, your love is. If we say that we love God, okay, we must also love who? Our neighbors. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength and everything that you have. We must also love your neighbor, our neighbor, as we have loved ourselves. The commandments, all the other commandments hang on this. It's a test of the sincerity of, of our love. One more proof. Turn with me to First John. Towards the end of your Bible, First John. John wrote the Gospel of John, and First John, Second John, Third John, and the Book of Revelation. Okay, that was all written by the Apostle uh, John. Okay, First John chapter chapter three. Verse 16 to verse 18. You with me? First John chapter 3, verse 16 to verse 18 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? You see? That's why Paul was saying, it is the test of the sincerity of your love. He says, I am not commanding you to give. Okay? But it is the test of the sincerity of your love. If your love is genuine as you claim it to be, if your love for God is genuine, then it must be reflected in or through giving. That's why uh, John writing to the church here says, if, if anyone sees, sorry, if anyone has material possessions, doesn't name the whatever material possession he has, but sees a brother in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be with that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Okay? The genuine love that has been shown, that is mentioned by Paul. Okay? So, the principle of, of love. When it comes to giving, okay, we have the principle of honoring God, and we also have the principle of love. This, is, this shows that you love somebody. You genuinely love someone by by helping others, contributing to the needs. We are here today because someone loved us. He died on the cross. Okay? While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us because someone, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. Okay? So giving is the overflow okay? of the of love. It shows that your love for God is genuine. It's not commanded, okay? But it should show. If we say that we love God, you must also love your neighbors. And if you know what the context of, of that verse is, that neighbor, okay, we were referring to a Samaritan, the enemy of the, the Jews. Not the, but they, they hated each other for, because the Jews, the Samaritans were mixed race. Okay, they were in the... Um, they were foreigners brought in by the Assyrians. It's in the Bible in the book of Kings, when the Assyrians conquered uh, Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, in 722 B.C. They took them over, and they, and they brought in uh, nationalities from other nations to work the land. And they, they, they had left behind the poorest of the poor to, 
to maintain the vineyards and the whatever that was left behind of the Israelites. So when these foreigners came in, they intermarried with the Jews that were left behind and then became known as the Samaritans, but it's a long story. It's, it's in your Bible. Okay, that's how we ended up with the Samaritans. So the Jews looked down on them because they were half-breed, but there's more to that story if you read, if you understand what happened between the, 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 the Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament when um, during the 400 silent years. They, they, they did a lot of other stuff. So that's why in the time of Jesus, they were hated. But when Christ said, okay, you love your, your neighbor, he was referring to your enemies. Okay? Feed them, clothe them if they're in need. It does, you didn't, don't have to know someone in order to love them. Okay? How can they know? How can an unbeliever know that we, we genuine, genuinely love God, that our love for God is sincere? Okay? By seeing what we do. That's why... Okay, one of the principles that I've written down to is the principle of Christian duty. It is our duty to do good, and part of the doing good is, is giving, okay? helping others. Another scripture reference on that. Okay, turn a few, few pages back. Book of James. James chapter 2, verse 14 to verse 17. Found it? Okay, James chapter 2, verse 14, verse 2, verse 17. It says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Okay, can such faith save them? Suppose, verse 13, uh, sorry, verse 15, a brother or a sister is without clothes okay, and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Okay? John talks about genuine love is reflected by helping and giving others. Okay? How can the love of Christ be in someone if he doesn't? Sure, doesn't it? And uh, James is talking about faith here. Yeah. Faith and deeds. These two go together. If we say that we have faith, but we do not have, show it by our actions, okay, then your faith is dead. Okay, if, any, if one of you says to them, oh sorry, verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? Okay. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. If faith is a dead faith, our faith is a dead faith if it is not accompanied by deeds. We are not saved by good works. But good works is a requirement, is a Christian duty after we are saved. Don't get me wrong. Okay? Book of Ephesians says we are saved by grace and not by faith. I mean, we are saved by grace through faith, and it is not by works, okay? so that no man can boast. Okay? But after someone is saved, we are required to do good works. Because if you read the book of Revelation, it says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on says the Lord, for their deeds will follow them. Okay? But your deeds, in the book of Isaiah, it says, your righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. That is before one believes in Christ. If, one, if you think that by doing good, it will add on to your salvation, I'm sorry. It will not add on to your salvation Okay? Because salvation is uh, by faith and through, uh, by grace and through faith alone in Christ. Okay? But after one is saved, you are required to, to show okay? by doing good. The love and the faith that has been mentioned here. Okay? So giving, okay? the principle of giving, how much time do I have? Right. The principle of of love, 
Okay? We, if we love God, if our love is genuine for God, we must uh, help those. Okay? We must give. And on the principle of honor, honoring God, if you honor God, okay, you must also honor God with, uh, with your wealth as well. Okay? It doesn't tell you how much, but it depends okay, on you. The amount is freely determined by you at the end. Of, it's between you and God. Number three, the principle of sowing and reaping. Okay. Again, we're all familiar with this, so I won't dwell on it long. Okay. We will reap according to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Okay. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And verse, verse uh, 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Okay, that's the context. Show, sowing sparingly, reap sparingly. Okay? Showing abundantly, you'll also reap abundantly. But okay? it doesn't tell you the amount. If you want to know the context, verse 7 says, Each of you should give what he or she okay, has decided in your heart to give. Okay? Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay? You'll reap what you, you sow, but uh, according to what you can give. Okay? God loves a cheerful giver at the end of the day. It's not commanded by God. Okay? But, okay? under the context, okay, the principles of sowing and reaping, okay? According to, each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Okay? Whatever your heart has decided to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. No one should force you to give. Okay? No one should tell you to give a certain amount. Okay? But each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give. For God loves a, a cheerful giver. Let's move on. Another principle on giving. I call it the principle of motives. Okay. Sowing, still on the context of sowing, but sowing with the right motives. Okay. Why do you give tithes? Okay. Why do you give your offerings? Why do you give to help others? Okay. What are the motives behind? Do you give because you want something? Do you give because uh, you expect blessings from God? The motives behind our what we do. We do not give, as Christians, we do not give to be blessed. You are already blessed because of Jesus Christ. Your blessings is in Christ Jesus. Amen. We give tithes, we give offerings, we help because we acknowledge where our source comes from. Amen. Not because we want to be blessed. That is the wrong motive of giving. You are already blessed in Christ. You're filled with the riches of God in Christ Jesus. Your blessings is not based on the amount that you give. Or what you give, but your blessings rest in the person of Jesus Christ. But we give, we tithe, we give offerings because we know where our source comes from. I want to read something. Deuteronomy chapter. Three, four, five, one of those chapters. Oh, sorry, chapter eight. It's a little long, but I will read. Okay. Just for us to understand okay, this principle. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter eight, from verse uh, 10 to verse 17. I will read. I'm reading from the NIV translation, a new international version. Some of you have different translations. 
It says, when you, you found it? I want us to be together. If not, you can write it down and you can read it home. Okay? When you have eaten and are satisfied, God is talking to the Israelites through Moses, praise the God, praise the Lord your God for the good things he has given you. Verse 11, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you today. Verse 12, otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, and when you build fine houses to settle down, when, you, when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Okay, let me read that verse, one, verse 12, okay? Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, Verse 14, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And we're going to skip verse 15. You can read that, verse 16. Verse 17, I want to read verse 17 and verse 18. Verse 17 says, you may say to yourself, my power and, my, and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Verse 18, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Don't forget how much God has blessed you with. Everything has increased in your life. Do not forget the Lord. And you may say to yourself in verse 17, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Yes, we are the ones who do all the work at the end of the day. Okay, we will say that. All of this I have built it by my own hand and my own strength. Verse 18, but remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Amen? Don't forget. God gives you the ability, the strength to do your work every day, the wisdom to do your work every day, who provides you with traveling mercies to work and back every day. You drive home to work, you come back in the afternoon, your family, your children is waiting for you. Who protects you to work and back every day? Who gives you the strength to do your work? Who gives you the ability, the wisdom, and the knowledge to do your work? God. Don't forget the Lord. Two more minutes. Okay, you may not believe in tithing or in giving, okay, but as some of you say, there may be not direct principles in the New Testament to talk about it, okay, but there are many principles in the Bible regarding giving. I shared briefly about another principle is the principle of okay, Christian duty. Okay. Our duty. Okay. We are saved and we are blessed to become a blessing to others as well. Okay. And giving is part of that, as I mentioned earlier. To conclude, I have, I have some others to share, but to conclude, okay. I made this up. It is a, called the principle of common sense. I made this up. It's, it's nothing in the Bible to, show, to talk about this. It's called the principle of common sense. Look at the fan. Look at the light, the projector. The air con is on. You come over on every two weeks. The, uh, you pick up a, a little cup and emblem for, for um, communion. Maybe Pastor Nigel comes in early every Sunday morning and there's manna that falls from heaven and he just collects them from the yard. Everything costs money. 
the running and the administration of the church, everything costs money. Sound system, mics, music, the lights, the fans, aircon keeps us nice and cool. It costs money. That's why I call it the principle of common sense. You may say God doesn't need money. Yes, God says gold is mine, silver is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to me, says the Lord. But the church does. Ministry does. If you love God, you'll also love his work. You will love ministry. Every, and ministry costs cost money. And that money comes from? From you and from my pocket at the end of the day. Amen. If you want to come in, okay, enjoy the view. This church is a beautiful church. It's rugged and covered and there's air con. Okay. We are blessed. Someone else has built this church before us from their pockets too. Okay. We're enjoying the blessings right now. Okay. And ministry costs money. It costs money to run everything in church. That's why I call it the, the principle of common sense. God doesn't need your money. Yes. But we do. The church does. The running of the church does. The bills to pay. The pastor needs to eat at the end of the day. If you read the book of Timothy chapter 5, I'm, going, I'm concluding. First Timothy chapter 5, somewhere down the line it says, okay, elder whose work is preaching and teaching, they're worthy of double honor. You know what double honor is? You honor them for their work. You honor them for their position in Christ. And also... If you read the context, it says there, the worker deserves his wages. And there is a, there's a word, there's a, an Old Testament quote there. It says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. You can find the story in the Old Testament, how they harvest their, their, their when they harvest their, their crops, or they harvest the wheat, they will, they will pile them around in a circle with a pole in the middle, and they'll plant, because they didn't have a presses in those days to separate the, the shaft and the, 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 the kernel from the, from the shaft. Okay. So they will use an ox or a bullock, and it'll be attached to the rope. And the bullock will, will tread, will walk around in circles. And what he does, he separates the husk from the, from the grain. It's a hard work. That's why the Bible says, and what the, the, the people used to do, they used to put a basket over the mouth of the, the ox so it wouldn't eat off the grains of its work. That's, the Bible says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. If he does the hard work, he deserves to eat from the share, or get a share from his labor as well. Okay, that's why the Bible in the first, first Timothy chapter 5, somewhere in one of the verses says, okay, a man... An elder whose job is preaching and teaching is worthy of double honor. You honor him for the hard work that he does, and he deserves to get a share of, the, of his hard work as well. Amen? Amen. That's, how the church, that's biblical. That is not my words. Okay, that's, that's how the, the kingdom of God functions. So the, to conclude for us today, is the few principles I have given. Okay, I have others, but okay. Number one, the principle of honoring God. Number two, the principle of love. Number three, the principle of sowing and reaping. Number four, the principle of Christian duty. The principle of motives, number five. And number six, which I made up, the principle of common sense. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we glorify you. Thank you for your many blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every soul that is present here. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for filling us with joy and with love and with peace. And the many blessings, Lord, words cannot describe how grateful and how thankful we are today. Thank you for your word. May your word find a lodging place in our hearts. 
We pray that we will not only be hearers, but help us and give us the strength to be doers of your word. Continue to burn within our hearts the desire for you, the passion for you, Lord, the zeal for you, the thirst and the hunger for you, Lord, for your word, for your righteousness, and for your work. Finish the good work that you have begun in each and every one of us, for you, Lord, who has called us, and you are faithful, Lord, to see us through. Lord, your children, you know them by name. You see their struggles. You see their tears. You understand what they're going through. Have your will and have your way. Glorify your name in and through their lives as you have always done, Lord Jesus. Meet their needs and supply their needs according to the riches of your glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the good work that you're doing in each and every one of us. We thank you for blessing us, our families, and whatever that we are doing, Heavenly Father. Lord, we just want to say thank you again for, for today. And thank you for all that you are doing and what you're going to need to do. Bless your people. Bless them when they come in and bless them when they go out. Bless them in the fields and bless them at home. And bless them the work of their hands. For the praise and glory of your name. In Jesus' mighty name. And all the children of the living God say, Amen, amen and amen.